So our first lecture was on recording EKGs. And now that we've recorded one, what are we going to do with that? So today we'll talk about basic interpretation. So there's really five components to, to interpreting an EKG. And is it regular? What's the rate? What's the P wave look like? What's my PR interval length? And what's my QRS width? So when we're talking about regularity, what we're talking about is the distance between the R waves and the distance between the P waves. because each of those represent different um, chambers of the heart and areas of the electrical, electrical system. So when you, we, when you say something is regular, it's the same distance between each of those. Your rate is the beats per minute. And remember, the, there's an electrical rate and there's a mechanical rate. Uh, just because you have EKG does not mean you have a pulse. Electrical activity without a pulse is called pulseless electrical activity, a form of cardiac arrest. But on all of these, we're going to assume there's a heart rate with that that's been assessed. And we're just in interpreting the EKG itself. So how many beats are there in a minute? The P wave should be upright and rounded. And P wave means that it's coming from the SA node, which is a normal pacemaker for the heart. Uh, PR interval should be between three small blocks and five, sm uh, five small blocks. So that's 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. And then you want to assess the width of your QRS. Remember, your, your normal QRS is actually 80 milliseconds. But the, more importantly, we just want to make sure that it's under 120 milliseconds. So when all five of those things are in the normal range, we get normal sinus rhythm, which most of us are in. So it's regular, the same distance between the P wave and P wave, R wave and R wave, the rates between 60 and 100. The P wave is upright and round. The PR interval is in the normal range and your QRS is less than 120 milliseconds. What happens if we just change the rate? Everything else is the same as a normal sinus rhythm, except the rate. So if that rate is now less than 60, we call that sinus bradycardia. The P wave indicates that it's coming from the SA node as it should, just the rate's slower than normal. This is a very well-tolerated rhythm. Uh, people who are, who are in great shape can have heart rates in the 30s and the 40s, uh, young athletes. So it's a very well-tolerated rhythm. Then you have sinus tachycardia, and that's a rate over 100. You'll see on here we list that there's a limit of 150, but that's not entirely accurate. As you approach 150 and higher, you need to assess, is this sinus tach or is this some type of reentrant tachycardia? We'll talk about those here in just a bit. So if the rhythm is not coming from the SA node, remember your secondary pacemaker in the heart is your AV node. And it's also called a junctional rhythm. It's junctional because that's where the atria and the ventricle meet, that's the junction of them, so the AV node. So here you'll notice that the P wave is, is inverted. Uh, so junctional rhythms are normally regular. Their rate is between 40 and 60. If it's truly a junctional rhythm and the rate's between 60 and 100, that's called accelerated junctional. And if it's over 100, it's junctional tachycardia. I've only seen one person in junctional tachycardia uh, in my time in cardiology. The uh, P wave can be before, during, or after, but if it's an if it's inferior lead, as in lead two, three, or AVF, your P wave is going to be inverted. And that's because the, the P wave is originating at the uh, AV node, basically in the center of the heart, and to cover the atria, it has to go away from your inferior leads. So that's why the P wave is inverted. Based on how fast that tissue can conduct that signal, will determine whether the P wave comes before the QRS, is hidden inside the QRS, or comes after the QRS. The PR interval will be less than 120 milliseconds if present at all. Here's an example of a junctional rhythm. Now in the cath lab, we can run our, our paper speed, our screen speed, anywhere between five millimeters a second up to 400 millimeters a second. Uh, where your normal EKG paper, your, it comes out 25 millimeters a second. This on the screen looks like a tachycardia, but it's not. And you'll see here we've condensed a number of heartbeats into one screen. There at the bottom, you can see two minutes, uh, 
it's at two o'clock, 49 minutes and four seconds. And then the end of the screen is basically two seconds later. So this is the, the, the red line is the catheter inside the aorta. And what you see is that uh, the natural ebb and flow of this, that's expiration. Uh, here's expiration, inspiration, expiration. That's a normal respiratory pattern. But here in the middle, what we've lost is our P wave. Up here, you see your P wave. And then we go into a junctional rhythm only for about 10 seconds. So there's no NIBP that would have caught that. You, if your external blood pressure cuff cycled, it would not have cycled fast enough to catch that. You have to have an art line to be able to appreciate this. But you'll see your pressure go from 140 some down to about 78 and then back up. Enough for that patient to feel it, to notice it, uh, to maybe feel faint or say they don't feel well. Uh, but this is a junctional rhythm. Not something that we treat all the time, but we see that it actually can have hemodynamic effects. Now let's talk about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, if a rhythm is irregular, it's considered AFib until proven otherwise. And that usually plays out. Uh, what you see here is there's no regularity in the irregularity. Some things that are, are repeating, we'll talk about some heart blocks here in a minute, that repeat a certain pattern. So they're irregular, but they're regularly irregular. AFib is irregularly irregular, meaning uh, you don't know which of these chaotic P waves is going to make it through the AV node. And you can see that that baseline, there's no clear P wave. All those bumps are P waves uh, chattering up there. Your number one problem with AFib is stroke, followed by heart failure. Uh, the patients do feel bad because they lose that that AV synchrony, the atria being synchronized with the ventricle. So that loss of synchrony can actually have a lot of hemodynamic effects. Another tachycardia is SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. And when you say, hey, didn't sinus tach SVT, well, based on that term, it is. It, it's a tachycardia that originates supra above the ventricles. But usually when we talk about SVT, we're talking about some type of reentrant tachycardia. Uh, here, it, it's very fast, rates over 150. Remember from our previous lecture, we talked about if there's one large block between the two uh, R waves, uh, that's a rate of 300. So this person is, is probably feeling quite poorly, uh, and it's a very fast rate. Now, most SVTs occur in the AV node. So here we've got an AV node. That actually would represent the coronary sinus because these fibers run around the coronary fiber, uh, sinus. And here we have a fast pathway which conducts the uh, signal at a normal speed. Here's a slow pathway where the signal kind of meanders down that. So the fast pathway can conduct, can go back up a little bit of the slow pathway, and those two wave fronts will cancel each other out. But the ironic thing about AV node tissue is that fast pathways reset or repolarize slowly and slow pathways repolarize quickly. So if a perfectly timed PAC happens, it can't go down the fast path because it's not repolarized yet. So here it meanders down the slow path, goes on down and conducts to the ventricles while going backwards retrograde up the, up the fast pathway. And now we, we fire the atria again and it goes back down. So that cycle continues. We have a reentrant tachycardia. And that's what 60% of SVTs are. That's an AV node reentrant tachycardia, a very common type of SVT. Another type of SVT is atrial flutter. And here you'll see the sawtooth pattern as characteristic. In your inferior leads, I'll show you here in just a second. Those, those flutter waves are actually inverted P waves. So the rate is usually, the atrial rate is between 250 and 300 uh, and 50. So your normal atrial rate is about 300. We'll see if that plays out here. There's an inverted P wave and an inverted P wave one block away from each other, one large block. So that's a rate of 300. Um, here, it looks like every third one's getting th getting through. Uh, well, I guess two to one. Uh, so that's a pretty typical type of flutter. So it's regular as far as your P waves or your QRSs go. 
and regular as far as your P waves go, uh, but the rates are very different. So what flutter is, is it's a irregular pathway that runs around the tricuspid valve. So here's your AV node, or here's your RA, your right atrium. Here's your right ventricle, your tricuspid valve, and that signal runs around that. So because this comes back here and goes back up the conduction system through the atria, uh, the, what the inferior leads see are inverted P waves. Now, the way we fix this in the cath lab is an electrophysiologist will actually burn a line with radio frequency. They'll scar a line from the uh, tricuspid valve over to the vena cava, and we've broken that circuit. So here's your typical flutter. Uh, your sawtooth pattern is an inferior lead phenomenon. So 2, 3, and AVF will have sawtooth pattern. Your other diagnostic feature is an upright P wave in V1. You have those two things, it's atrial flutter. Now atrial flutter is actually a very common uh, cause of false activation for STEMI. And the reason is these flutter waves, these F waves, can land anywhere uh, beside the QRS. The ones that do not conduct that are not related to the QRS. So sometimes these will land uh, the, the peak of it will land right after the QRS, making it look like ST elevation. And sometimes uh, the bottom of it will land beside the QRS, making it look, look like ST depression. And that's why that's a common cause of false activations. Here's an example of that, where you could convince yourself that these are elevations uh, and that these are depressions, but they're not. These are just flutter waves uh, landing beside the QRS. One of the best pieces of advice I got with Flutter was if the rhythm just doesn't look right, it's probably Flutter. So if you just can't quite place it, it's probably Flutter. So let's look at this right here. Uh, here it lands pretty close to a, a bold line, and there's your next bold line. So that's a rate of 300 and then a rate of 150. So we're probably about 175. This patient's going to have a cardiac reason for feeling bad. They're in this tachycardia, and we have these questionable waveforms. Uh, but this is a type of flutter. Do most STEMIs happen at a rate of 175? Well, it's not impossible, but it's not probable. Uh, this person's problem is most likely their rate, not a heart attack. Uh, so flutter is a, is a common cause for false activations. All right, let's talk about heart blocks. So if we talk about heart blocks, uh, something is not that is originating in the atria is not making it through to the ventricle. So there's four types. A first degree uh, has the same number of P waves, except it's just being slowed down. So that's we we see that in the PR interval, it'll be greater than 200 milliseconds. All the other types have more P's than Q's. All you have to know to determine which one it is is to know the PR interval. You'll see here the second degree type one, a winky buck, gets the PR interval gets progressively longer until it can't conduct. So it blocks your second degree type two will always have the same PR interval and your third degree heart block will have no relationship. So let's look at those. Here's your first degree heart block. Here's a P wave that landed that starts at one of the bold lines. The next bold line comes and goes and the QRS has not happened yet. Therefore, we have a wide PR interval. Uh, so that's a first degree heart block. Uh, usually is just noted, nothing that we treat typically. Here we have more P's than Q's. Pretty easy to see. We have a P wave, two P waves with no QRS in there. So something blocked, something did not conduct. We dropped a QRS. Uh, we have more P's than carrots. You'll hear all those types of things in, in the different type of EKG te teachings. Uh, but here, what's your PR interval? So when we know we have more P's than Q's, let's start by looking at your PR interval, and let's measure that backwards because we know we're looking at something that got through and we'll go back to what uh, originated that. Uh, so here is a certain length. This one's longer. This one's even longer. And then we drop. So when you have progressing, uh, length, or progressively lengthening PR intervals, uh, that's a second degree type one. This is an AV node problem most of the time. A lot of times it's medication related. Uh, so you fix that medication issue, 
and you'll probably fix the problem. But AV nodes are, in, are implicated in second degree type one, Winky Bach. Second degree type two, here's a couple of different versions. Uh, this one has more P's than Q's because there's two P waves with no QRS. If you weren't staring at your monitor, you may not even have ever seen that. These can all be very transient. Here, it, it's very easy to see. It's a two to one block. For every two P waves, you get one QRS. Uh, but in all of these, the PR interval is the same. Uh, whether you're looking at the top one uh, comparing those or the bottom one comparing those. So when you have more P's and Q's, but your PR intervals are always the same, that's a second degree type two. That's usually a, a Hissian problem. That's in the, the bundle of Hiss, and that's where your issues are. These are more problematic and more indicative of structural damage, uh, whether it's due to um, aging, whether it's due to calcification of these areas or ischemia. Here's an example in the cath lab of a uh, second degree heart, type two heart block that comes on there where it's normal for a little bit and then all of a sudden uh, we start dropping. So second degree type two. Then your third degree, your third degree heart block can be very tricky. It can, it can look very, you know, your whatever's rescuing, whatever's escaping in the heart to provide a, a QRS is very regular. So it can actually be very, um, it can blend into other rhythms and take a, a second to, to, to determine it. Uh, but on this top one, we have, there's two P waves. So we have more P's than Q's. And then what's your PR interval? Well, here it's real long. There is real short. Here it's extremely long. There's nothing that we've talked about that complies with that. So it has to be, a, it's, it's not getting progressively longer. It's not always the same. Therefore, it has to be third degree heart block. There's some other ways you can kind of troubleshoot this. Uh, do all your QRSs and do all your T waves look the same? Well, here's a really tall T wave. Well, when you march this out, your P waves will be grossly regular. Your QRSs will be grossly regular, but they're all on their independent rates. Remember, this P wave has a rate of 60 to 100 beats a minute as its normal range. It has no idea the rhythm is not getting through. So whatever is escaping is providing your heartbeat. Here, it's, it's your junction, because we, we and we know that because the QRS is nice and narrow. Down here, your rate is... 20 to 40, because these are wide ventricular escapes uh, that are trying to keep this person alive. So here your P waves march out re very regularly. Your QRSs march out very regularly. Uh, but there's no relationship. More P's and Q's. What's this PR interval? Extremely long, short, even shorter. That's not a pattern we've talked about. So there has to be a third degree heart block. Here, you, let's see if our uh, plan works out. Do all the QRSs look the same? Well, no, you, if you march out your P waves, you'll find that that's a P wave right there. Uh, so second, third degree heart block. Uh, these will get uh, pacemakers unless they are uh, asymptomatic and there is a different type of cause and an adequate rate and a treatable cause uh, for, for what's causing that. So here's an example of rhythm. It's, hey, it's kind of wide, kind of ugly. What is that? Well, notice that your P waves, when you march them out, are grossly regular. And then when you march out your QRSs, they are grossly regular. Uh, but that's a, a complete heart block. This was a 93-year-old female, uh, complete heart block. You see your P waves in here, and she would escape with a run of VTAC and then uh, have more P waves. Ironically, blood pressure was 140 over 80, and she said, sweetie, are you sure I need this, this uh, pacemaker? Uh, to which we replied, uh, absolutely, uh, but very well tolerated by, by certain patients, mainly elderly females. Then you'll see PVCs on your monitor. So PVCs are just premature ventricular contractions. Um, it probably better to call it a premature ventricular complex because some of them will conduct, but some of them won't. Uh, but it usually goes in the opposite direction of your other QRSs uh, because it's coming from a different area. And um, here's it's wide, so we know that it's ventricular. The reason ventricular rhythms are wide is because they're not on the wiring. That Purkinje system is firing. So what you have is these narrow ones are on a wire and they fire and conduct quickly. 
Ventricular rhythms have to activate from cell to cell to cell. So that takes longer. Therefore, width represents time. That's why PVCs or any ventricular rhythm is a wider rhythm. Uh, we do uh, PVC ablations in the cath lab, but typically you, you have to have over 30% of your heartbeats uh, being caused or coming from your PVC. And when the load's that high, you probably feel bad with those, and that's something that can be ablated. When we string those together, we have VTAC, so ventricular tachycardia. So that's wide, and the rate has to be over 100 for it to be a VTAC. Uh, so normally in the 170 range, but it can, it can vary. Uh, you can see some slow VTACs that are just over 100, but it, it is originating in the, in the ventricle. Uh, so you won't have a P, uh, P wave and you won't have a PR interval. The QRS will be wide because it's ventricular. Sometimes you may see a P wave try to sneak through, but there's nothing regular about it, and they do not cause the QRS the QRS, so they are disassociated. And that's actually a pretty good sign that they're actually uh, coming from uh, the ventricle. Uh, here, uh, this is pretty close to a fusion beat. You've got a P wave that meets uh, a V wave, and those kind of cancel each other out. It's not the same amplitude here. But when you see a, a, a and they're usually more stumpy than that, a stumpy uh, complex, that's typically a fusion beat and is another pretty good sign that what's driving this rhythm is coming from the ventricles. And the problems with tachycardia here, here's your A line at the bottom. This is a ventricular waveform. Uh, but what you see happen is you don't have as much filling time because these beat quickly. Uh, they come in quick succession. Uh, so we don't have time to fill the ventricle, and you can see each heartbeat has a lower blood pressure with that. And torsades is another type of uh, polymorphic uh, tachycardia. Polymorphic meaning it has different uh, forms, different waveform looks, uh, but it's a tachycardia, and it's coming from the ventricles. I always think of this as footballs. It looks like footballs going down the, the screen. Uh, and that's a, a sign of torsades. There's about four different types of torsades when you study it more deeply. Uh, but the, if there is no pulse, then this is treated just like V-fib or V-tac. Remember, V-fib and V-tac are um, pulseless rhythms and they're shockable rhythms. Uh, so it's important to defibrillate that very quickly. And then finally, V-fib. This is your, your, your premier shockable rhythm. VTAC could have a pulse, torsades could have a pulse, VFib will not have a pulse with that. Uh, so that it's very chaotic, there's no rhythmic QRS coming through. Uh, so this is a form of cardiac arrest and it needs defibrillation and CPR.